to the extraordinary um, whaling port of New Bedford, which is, is still a very important fishing port in the United States. New Bedford for the last more than 20 years has been the number one fishing port in the United States in terms of the value of the catch. So there's still an awful lot of waterfront activity happening here. But it began to reorient my thinking uh, about the Underground Railroad. And as I had been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, overseas empires and the maritime side of overseas empires, the, the necessity of ships and the technology of navigation and so on, I started thinking about how these threads came together uh, in the Underground Railroad. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we proceed. Um, so the first image that I want to share with you here, if my slides will, will, will advance, let's see. And I'm having a little issue with my, oh, there we go. Okay. So this is a map uh, from the um, National Geographic Society. And it's a map that shows how the Underground Railroad is often uh, taught in schools in the United States and, and how it's often conceptualized. But there are some big problems that I'd like you to, uh, to ask you to reconsider and, and think a little bit about what this map represents. So while there is this nod to the offshore maritime component of the Underground Railroad, the vast majority of the scholarship of the Underground Railroad over the last um, hundred years or so has focused almost exclusively on landbound escapes. And the problem with this map and the way it represents the Underground Railroad is that it would have us believe that people were escaping by foot from very far in the deep south, from Georgia and the Carolinas and North Carolina and Southern Virginia and Alabama and Mississippi, that they're escaping overland, um, you know, hundreds of miles by foot or by wagon or by horse. And the problem with that is that the historical evidence doesn't back that up. Um, if you look at the historical record and all of the recorded successful escapes that were reported uh, before and even after the, the American Civil War, uh, the vast majority of successful escapes all began very close to a border with a free state. So there are people escaping from eastern Missouri and northern Kentucky and West Virginia and Maryland and maybe northern Virginia and some in Delaware, but they're only escaping from at most two or three days walk away from the border with a free state. To escape overland through hostile territory where there were constantly patrols looking out for escaped enslaved people, where there were big logistical problems facing enslaved people who were trying to escape overland, the problem of being unfamiliar with the geography, the problem of uh, safely finding refuge during the day, the problem of being challenged for their, their papers that would have allowed them uh, or any kind of permission that would have allowed them to be abroad in the countryside without their owner with them. These were almost insuperable problems that most people escaping overland couldn't uh, overcome unless they were quite close to a free state. By contrast, if you were a enslaved person along the Southern coast and even in the Gulf of Mexico, but our book focuses on uh, the, the Eastern seaboard exclusively, even if you're very, very far in the deep South, you could get on a ship uh, and within just a few days with very little effort, you're riding along on a ship uh, within five or six days, you can be from someplace even as far south as Charleston or Savannah. You can be in a free port because you're following the Gulf Stream and under very good sailing conditions, you could make that journey very quickly. So you wouldn't have to carry a lot of food. You wouldn't have to stay out of sight and hidden because very frequently you might do this with the complicity and the cooperation of people aboard ships who might be helping you to escape. So what we decided to do, and I'm going to advance the slide, this is uh, a, a, a pretty well-known map that's been often reproduced. It's from a book published at the very end of the 19th century, 1898, uh, a map by William Siebert, uh, who wrote and, and gathered primary source information from people who had either op been operatives of the Underground Railroad or who had escaped through the Underground Railroad. And he mapped 
uh, many of the routes that that people that people took. And so there are a couple of things to note here. First of all, uh, according to his representation of the Underground Railroad at the end of the 19th century, as he understood it, the Underground Railroad operated mainly in the North with sympathetic abolitionist-minded people helping enslaved African-Americans uh, to escape across free states. And of course, I grew up near Dayton, Ohio. I was born in Detroit. Detroit was a major crossover point uh, to Canada. And of course, Ohio, uh, having a lot of abolitionists in Ohio, uh, was crisscrossed by lots of uh, Underground Railroad routes. Um, the point here is that um, what he doesn't show is people escaping from the very far south. But he does show that there were people escaping from ports like the port of Norfolk, Portsmouth, and other places further south along the Atlantic seaboard. Well, this whole book came about, and, and I should hasten to say, I'm the editor. I wrote the introduction in the first chapter, but I was joined. I couldn't have done this project without nine other historian colleagues who were just wonderful to work with, who contributed to the volume, and who had um, experience and, uh, and scholarly insight to parts of the United States that I didn't know very well. And so uh, with the, the knowledge and the expertise of this great group of scholars, we put together this book. It came together though, because of funding that we got from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, when I first moved to New Bedford, I became acquainted with a group here called the New Bedford Historical Association, led by a wonderful woman named Lee Blake. Uh, and they focus their attention exclusively on the stories of people of color in this region. So they're looking not only at African Americans, but also Wampanoag Indians, other Native American groups, and uh, immigrant groups that came to this area from places like the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic and, uh, and folks from other parts, um, people who arrived because of whaling uh, from the Pacific Islands and so on. So this organization uh, approached me and said, hey, there's this great story to tell about New Bedford's role in the Underground Railroad. Because of the whaling industry in the 19th century, New Bedford was attracting uh, large numbers of African-Americans, many of whom were escaping from the South, and they were coming to work in the whaling industry, either on the waterfront or on the whaling ships themselves as, as mariners. And, um, and so I became very intrigued by this story. And it turned out that, you know, a lot of these people are arriving to New Bedford from the South aboard ships as they're escaping from the American South along the seaboard. Now, some of you may be familiar with this book. Uh, a colleague of mine, Jeff Bolster, wrote uh, a book and this came out in the late 90s. It was called Blackjacks. And in the book, he made the argument and, and was able to prove that about 20% of all mariners, all working mariners on American flagged vessels were African-Americans uh, prior to the Civil War. So, you know, a big chunk, about one in five uh, of the working sailors on board American flagged merchant ships and, uh, and whaling ships and, and coastal um, trading ships, they're, they're black guys who are working on boats and getting all kinds of experience and cosmopolitan um, uh, information about the geography, the, 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 the political landscape of the American coast, and they become really essential for spreading information in the US Black population prior to the Civil War. They are intermediaries between the North and the South, uh, and they have contact with enslaved Black people in the South of the United States. So to really understand how this whole process of escape by water works, it's very important to understand that the entire working uh, population, the workforce of the docks and many of the, 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 the boats in the American South was enslaved African-American men, mainly men, sometimes women, but the entire waterfront labor force uh, is enslaved people. We think about you know, the, the idea of African-Americans working in a plantation context, doing agricultural work, and that's certainly true, but the, the ports of the American South could not have functioned if it weren't for enslaved Black labor. So what were they doing? They're doing all kinds of things. On the waterfront, they are dock and wharf workers. They are longshoremen loading and unloading ships. They're stevedores. 
They're working in warehouses. They are drovers and teamsters bringing cartloads of provisions and other goods to the ships. They're taking stuff away from the waterfront in terms of imported cargo. Um, they are, they are uh, absolutely necessary shipyard labor. And they're also doing a lot of the maintenance work on these wooden vessels. They are caulkers, um, sealing the seams of vessels. They're riggers, they are uh, sail makers, and they are guys who know how to do the kind of repairs that are necessary to keep the, um, the sailing vessels of the American waterfront afloat. And remember, this is a time when there aren't very many uh, roads. Uh, almost all heavy cargo is being moved by water. Uh, and that includes the, the plantation produced agricultural goods that have to be brought down out of the interior of the American South on tidal waterways and then loaded onto larger ships to be shipped out to markets in various places in the world, but often, often to the American North. Not only are these guys working on waterfronts, but they are also watermen themselves, very, very skilled uh, boatmen who do all kinds of essential labor. They are fishermen, they are oystermen, they are working on ferries, they are lightermen. A lighter is a, a large kind of cargo boat that is used to load and unload vessels, not on a dock, but at anchor or out in a mooring in the harbor. Boats that were too big to get to the dock, they were loaded and unloaded with lighters. They're also skilled mariners. They are deckhands, even pilots, uh, piloting vessels in and out of harbor. So they have enormous skill, enormous experience, and they use this experience and these skills to leverage possibilities for escape. Um, so the American uh, landscape, if we, if we look at, uh, there are some extraordinary maps that were produced around the time of the Civil War that show the, the distribution of the enslaved population in the American South. And so this census map, which I think is 1860, uh, shows that there's a lot of uh, enslaved population concentrated around seaports in the South, uh, and in the, um, the saltwater waterways of the Chesapeake and in some of the harbors uh, in the inland waterway area of the Carolinas and Virginia. Um, and so this, the strategic knowledge of these waterfront workers, these port workers, and these mariners is strategic knowledge that then they could use uh, and, and, uh, and parlay into opportunities for escape. If we just look at South Carolina, this is a map from a slightly earlier period, but the same effect is true. You can see that the most densely um, uh, populated areas of the enslaved population is all along uh, the, the, the waterfront areas. And these little, little waterways that reach pretty far inland is what is uh, the, the means by which plantation produced goods are being taken down to the larger harbors and then to be loaded onto ships. And all of that labor is being done by enslaved African-Americans. Uh, this is described very well in a book by David Soselsky called uh, The Waterman's Song about slavery and freedom in North Carolina. He, he focuses on North Carolina, but as an, a, a contributor to, to the book, uh, he was able to um, fill in this component very effectively and talk about uh, how this um, waterfront labor became absolutely important for Underground Railroad escapes by water. So you might ask yourself, how do we know, how can we prove that this was happening? And it's important to understand that uh, and remember that this is clandestine illegal activity. People escaping uh, are trying to keep it secret. So they don't leave behind a lot of their own personal records about escaping from enslavement, especially prior to the Civil War when they want to keep the knowledge of their escape, uh, as little information about it from circulating as possible. So we know about it through other ways. And one of the ways that we know about it is through what are called runaway slave advertisements. In United States newspapers from the middle of the 18th century, from about the 1740s, onward until the time of the Civil War, until about 1863, you have over 220,000 runaway slave advertisements published in, in US newspapers or North American newspapers. And what often happens in these runaway slave advertisements, which are, which are placed by the owners of enslaved people who want to recover their property, 
they include significant information that will help in the recovery of their property. So they include a physical description of the person. They include something about their age and what they were wearing, but they also include information about how they think their enslaved person made their escape. And very, very frequently, we see references to people escaping by water. So in this case, from 1772, we have the part that I've highlighted. Uh, this is a young man named Phil. He's about 20 years old, five foot nine. As he has been used to the sea, he's a mariner. He will probably endeavor to get on board some ship and make his escape out of the colony. So all masters of vessels are therefore forewarned from harboring him or carrying him off at their peril. So we see an acknowledgement that people are escaping by water and they are starting to enact rules and regulations that can punish or make it a crime for, for uh, ship captains or masters to take away people who are property and owned in the, in the American states that uh, where, where slavery was legal. By the 1770s, this is true also of the North. The Northern states were also uh, uh, places where slavery was legal up until the time of the revolution. So we have all kinds of these uh, advertisements. Here's one, absconded from the household of the president of the United States on Saturday afternoon, Oni Judge. So that household was the household of, of George Washington. This is 1796. And he is in Philadelphia, where by 1796, slavery had been outlawed. But a young woman in his household who found out that she was likely to be taken back to Virginia and would have no hope of being uh, uh, freed, decides to make good her escape. And Washington's agent put this advertisement in the paper. It says, but as she may attempt to escape by water, all masters are vessels and others are, are cautioned against receiving her on board. And in fact, what we know is that she did escape by water from Philadelphia down the Chesapeake and then up the East Coast. She ends up in New, New Hampshire. And Washington, who lived another uh, almost four years, spent the rest of his life trying to get young Oni Judge back as his property. She, he was never successful. She lived uh, into the middle of the 19th century. And her entire life uh, later, she, she published uh, an account of, um, uh, of reasons why she never went back uh, into the household of President Washington. So that's another example. Uh, moving on into the 18th century, this is from Baltimore. Uh, it's a broadside advertisement uh, from 1810. And again, uh, it's talking about an, a young man named Jack, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, um, his object is to go to sea and will be trying to ship on board some vessel bound out. All masters of vessels and others are forewarned, harboring or taking off said Negro at their peril. And so we see this again and again. Now, so I said that there were 220,000 of these advertisements, how many of them have references to the sea? I can't tell you that because the advertisements are dispersed in a number of different archives, and there's been no success in getting them all together so that we can do, and, and to digitize them so that they can be searched in a, in a way. There's an effort to do that at Cornell University, but what I can tell you is that we've found thousands of ex examples of this, uh, and so we, we have high confidence that the percentage of this is quite high but I can't tell you precise numbers. Also in part because, again, this is clandestine illegal activity, and we often only find out about escapes when they're unsuccessful, when people are caught and taken back into enslavement. Uh, here's another example from the mid-19th century. I think this is 1840. Uh, this is two people who have escaped, uh, and both of them have had for a long time relations with the Negro fishermen at the bayou. So there are references of uh, black watermen in the South uh, aiding in the escape, or the suspicion is, is that they're aiding in the escape of uh, very valuable property. The other way, there are several other ways that we know about this, but one way we know about it is because of the laws and the ordinances that are enacted by uh, port towns in the U.S. South and by states in the South to try to curtail this activity. And it's very clear when you read the accounts of the owner class, they are convinced that their ports are an absolute sieve of people escaping annually, where they're losing enormous quantities of valuable property, human property, 
But they're also, it's a, it's not only a, a drain on the economy, it's also a, a brain drain. Some of their best and most skilled watermen are escaping every year and they're, they're, they, they're bound to try to stop it. And so what do they do? They enact laws giving uh, local commissioners the power to search vessels, to fumigate vessels that are outbound to northern ports. Uh, they enact an, a, a series of measures to try to stop people from getting out on northbound vessels. They also are very, very worried that African-American sailors who are free, free Black men who are working on northern ships, um, that they are encouraging the enslaved population to try to escape. And so southern states and southern port cities enact laws that restrict the movements of those African-American sailors. They put them, they, they, they force them to stay on board the ship during the entire time that the ship is in port, or they actually even go to the lengths of incarcerating them until their ships leave harbor. And so their movement is restricted so that they cannot work as, um, uh, as agents to encourage the escape of enslaved African-Americans in the South. Now, here's another newspaper advertisement, but it's not a runaway slave ad. It's a really interesting uh, advertisement. It's from New Bedford, a New Bedford newspaper, the Medley Maritime Journal, 1797. And it is placed by a ship captain named William Tabor, well-known captain. And he is responding to the uh, requirements of the first Fugitive Slave Act that Congress passed in 1793. And that, that Fugitive Slave, most of us are familiar with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, but there was an early one in 1793, which began to erect um, a legislative answer to the problem of uh, enslaved people escaping from states where slavery was legal to states where slavery was not legal. And it, and it specifically, uh, referenced ship captains who were implicated in escapes. And so anyone who was involved in the movement of someone's property without that person's permission uh, could became liable for punishment if they did it knowingly, if they were willingly complicit in this. And so ship captains often then uh, publish these kinds of notices to try to give themselves legal coverage. So I'd like to read through this it's very it's it's interesting to read, but we have to read between the not lines so that we really know what's going on here. So, public notice to all whom it may concern: Know ye that I, William Tabor, commander of the sloop Union, sailed from the York River in Virginia on or about the twenty eighth of March last, bound to this port, New Bedford. That on the day after sailing, I discovered a Negro on board said sloop who had concealed himself, unbeknownst to me. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know he was on board. He just turned up. He was a stowaway. I am not to blame. That's what he's saying. To go on, it appearing inconsistent for me to return, the wind being ahead, I proceeded on my voyage and I landed him in this port, New Bedford. So what he's saying is the weather did not allow me to turn my vessel around and return this property to its rightful owner. I had to continue sailing northward because uh, the weather wouldn't permit me to turn around, which was a legitimate excuse in the age of sail. You know, you have to do what the winds are compelling your vessel to do. And, and this, this was a, a legitimate um, defense. Um, another point that's important to make here, uh, in the 19th century, international waters began three miles offshore. And so federal law, once you were outside that three mile limit, uh, federal law didn't really reach to uh, shipping moving up and down the coast. And so um, uh, that was an important thing to understand for, uh, for the entire duration of the Maritime Underground Railroad. Uh, folks who got on board vessels were relatively safe uh, as long as they were out of port and on the high seas interna in international waters. Okay, to carry on, he calls his name James. Is that really his name? We don't know. He's about 27 years old and says he belongs to Mr. Shackelford, a planter in Kings and Queens County, Virginia. Did he really belong to Mr. Shackelford? Again, we, we really can't say, but that's what he said. 
Any person claiming him will know by this information where he is, for which purpose it is made public in this manner, and every legal method has been taken to prevent the owner losing the property in my power. So the thing to remember here is that while this newspaper published in New Bedford probably would have made it to Virginia because newspapers circulated up and down the coast, this was a weekly publication. And by the time the owner saw it, James, his property could be anywhere in Canada, in upstate New York, someplace where he would be safe from re-enslavement. But this, this advertisement gave the captain legal coverage so that he couldn't be prosecuted or punished for uh, having moved an enslaved person to the North. There are, other, um, there are other advertisements like this where Southerners are complaining about Northern captains moving their enslaved property to the North without their permission. So here's one uh, that's uh, published in Maryland, and um, it's about a runaway whose name is Harry, about 23 years old. Uh, Harry is supposed to be carried off by a certain Thomas Wainer of Westport in Massachusetts. That's a town, a couple of uh, towns over from New Bedford. Um, and the captain is a mulatto. He's an African-American descended guy uh, who trades here and cleared out as captain of a small vessel from Westport. He came to the port of Snow Hill, Maryland, where he got a load of corn and staves and cleared for Norfolk, Virginia. So the newspaper in the South is saying, look, beware, because there's this captain who's been helping um, uh, enslaved people to escape. And you see these as well as evidence that this is actually going on in significant numbers. Another way that we know about this is because of publications, uh, slave narratives or escape narratives that are published by uh, persons who had escaped um, uh, from enslavement and then wrote about it, usually after they were safe. Uh, someone like um, Frederick Douglass publishes uh, an autobiography prior to the Civil War, which was unusual. Most of these happen, uh, are published after the Civil War, but, or after the Civil War has begun. Um, but what's interesting is that of the known slave narratives that are published, uh, and there are over a hundred of them, more than 70% reference escape by water. And that's a really significant number, very high number of these published accounts that talk about folks escaping by sea. So here's a pretty well-known one. This is Thomas Jones, 1849. He had been a longshoreman in Wilmington, North Carolina, and he gets on a, a ship called a, a brig called the Bell, and he gets to New York, and the captain, who who was not uh, uh, complicit in this act of escape, goes on shore to get a federal um, uh, a federal sheriff to uh, or uh, sorry a federal official to re-enslave Thomas Jones. And at this point, Thomas Jones escapes over the side of the brig. He's being chased here by the first mate and some of the crew, and he gets picked up by two abolitionists who take him and and uh, secure him and secret him away and get him into the Underground Railroad in New York, and he makes good his escape. He goes to New Bedford and eventually publishes in Boston his account of this uh, escape. There are lots of these. Here's one. This is uh, John Jacobs. Uh, the, the portrait is in about 1848. Uh, he had escaped uh, from North Carolina to New Bedford. He escaped by sea. Uh, his sister is Harriet Jacobs, who's a pretty well-known uh, person who had escaped also from slavery by ship. Uh, he served on a whaling voyage to the Pacific. Uh, and this portrait, which was just identified about two years ago, uh, he's holding a copy of The Liberator, which is fantastic because he himself became a very active abolitionist. But this portrait is held by the African-American Museum of Philadelphia um, and uh, and we used it in an exhibition about this immediately after it had been identified as him. It's one of the, the coolest pieces we had in our exhibition. Uh, another well-known story, Elizabeth Blakely, uh, she escapes and her story isn't published until the 1920s. She was only 15 years old when she escaped. She stowed away. She suffered, uh, she fled in the wintertime and the voyage that she was on was delayed. She was about two weeks at sea and got really badly frostbitten, but she survived and, and eventually her story is published in the 1920s. Uh, we also have narratives from abolitionists working on the waterfronts of the North. 
Uh, this guy, Austin Bierce, was an abolitionist in Boston. He had a yacht called the Moby Dick. And in 1853, interestingly, just after the book Moby Dick was published, he named his yacht after Moby Dick. And um, he, he, they, the abolitionists in Boston, when ships would arrive from the South, they would go out and very quietly make inquiries, particularly among African crew members of these vessels, if there was any contraband on board. Uh, and if there was, they would go out at night and very quietly take off the fugitive and bring them to land them in Boston and then get them into the hands of other abolitionists who would spirit them away from Boston and get them out of danger so they wouldn't be re-enslaved by, uh, by bounty hunters and uh, federal officials who after 1850 and, the, and, the, and the, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 were bound by federal law to try to uh, re-enslave people who had escaped from enslavement. So we have all of these accounts that are published that give us information about people escaping by water. Probably the best one, or one of the very best ones, is uh, the book by William Still, who was a famous underground operator, of course, in Philadelphia. Many of you know that. He, was a, uh, he, he ran a safe house near the waterfront uh, in Philadelphia's port. Uh, and he publishes a book in 1872 called The Underground Railroad, A Record of Facts, Authentic Letters. And he recounts over 600 uh, 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 events of people where he's helping them to escape. And a very large proportion of them are by water. In the original book, some of the uh, illustrations included in the book uh, are um, episodes that take place with people escaping by ship. This one, uh, Captain Fontaine and the schooner city of Richmond, uh, this is November of 1855, there were actually more than 20 people secreted away on this relatively small wooden schooner. It is searched uh, by um, officials in Norfolk, and they don't find the fugitives, and Captain Fontaine sails on his way and, and successfully lands them uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, another illustration from William Still's book is clandestine, clandestine landing of fugitives from Norfolk, Virginia on League Island in Philadelphia in 1856. And I really like this illustration because it, it includes a lot of the components of the Maritime Underground Railroad, which are important to know about. So for one, we see that entire families are escaping on, on vessels. It was a way that you could safely take children on board and get them to safety. It was very, very hard to escape overland with children. Uh, it was difficult to escape over overland with uh, uh, with with women. Most of the successful escapes on land or sea are young men who are um, physically able to um, overcome the rigors of of escape. But on board ship, because it was relatively easy and because you were along for the ride young ch uh, children, women could also escape. The other thing that's important to see here is that the Underground Railroad operatives are often African-Americans and they are putting people into carriages with veiled windows so that they can be then taken through the city and no one can look inside to see who's, in, who's inside the carriage. So this is happening at night and, uh, and we see people being, being offloaded from, uh, from a vessel that has arrived from the South. Um, there are some really famous stories, too, and some of them I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, the story of Robert Smalls, for example, who, uh, who had been a, a skilled waterman. He was a pilot, although he wasn't allowed to use the title of pilot. Um, and he was working aboard a Confederate gunboat uh, in, um, in May of 1862, a gunboat called the Planter. And he and some of his fellow crewmen commandeered this gunboat and took it out from Charleston Harbor right under the nose of the authorities. And, and this is an amazing story. Uh, I won't linger long on it, but uh, he is immediately taken into the US Navy uh, by because he has delivered this gunboat to them. He then serves through the Civil War and eventually he's elected to Congress. He, he becomes well-to-do. He buys the home of his former enslaver and moves into it. It's a fascinating story. and. Uh, and there is, I'm told, there's a film being made about him. So some of you are aware of this story, but there are other ones too. So this very famous photo of the, um, the Monitor, uh, which is taken in May of 1862, and this very prominent African-American crewman here, 
He'd only been aboard for a few days when this photo was taken. Uh, he had recently fled uh, as, a, as an escaped uh, enslaved person. He had stolen a boat, gone down the James River, and asked to be taken aboard as a member of the crew, and then was photographed by a guy called James Gibson uh, not long after his escape. Uh, his name is Shai Hewlett Carter. And then another story that came to my attention as I was working on the book, this is a guy, Dempsey Hill, who also had this fantastic story. Um, during the blockade of Beaufort, North Carolina, uh, he, had, he was a skilled waterman. He had been working in the port of Beaufort, and he realized that the, um, the Union blockading vessels could make great use of charts that were from the customs house in Beaufort. And so he stole these charts, he hid them in a cemetery, and then he and several other African-American watermen escaped uh, and took a pilot boat and sailed out to um, the blockading Union forces and turned over the charts and also joined as an able seaman and he served throughout the war. Later, he settles in Massachusetts, very close to where I am on Buzzards Bay, and became known as a, um, as a pleasure boat captain. And he was so well liked that uh, the Boston Globe ran a pretty significant obituary of him when he died in the 1890s. And for a person of color to get an obit in the Boston Globe in the 1890s, he had to be a very prominent person uh, in this area and was well loved by, um, by, uh, by some of the elites of the area who, would, who relied on him as a pleasure boat captain in Buzzards Bay at the end of the 19th century. Well, I want to finish up with just some comments about New Bedford, because New Bedford's place in all this as a, as a destination, an endpoint, a terminus on the Underground Railroad was very significant. Um, and, and by the 1840s, uh, New Bedford had a reputation, uh, even in the South, as a place where fugitives would escape to. New Bedford had the highest per capita population of African Americans of any city in the North. Now, there were certainly more African Americans living in Boston or, 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 sorry, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, but as a percentage of the population, New Bedford was higher. It was about 9%. And, and many of those folks, uh, we know from the, the census information that we get, and also from the city directories, we know that many of those African Americans had been born in the South. They started to change their birthplace records after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. They started to record their, uh, their birthplace as somewhere different, Philadelphia or New York. But prior to that, they usually recorded that they had been born in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, places like that. Um, and so we see a lot of people escaping to New Bedford. Why? Well, New Bedford, of course, was the capital of whaling. There were thousands of whalers, uh, people coming to work on the docks, on the whaling ships. Uh, there were about 700 whaling vessels at the peak of Yankee whaling, uh, and about mm, 450 of them, I think, were based in New Bedford or its sister port across the harbor of Fairhaven, Massachusetts. It was known as the Fugitives Gibraltar, and it's the premier, premier whaling port. And that the, the, the business of whaling is in the hands of Quakers, the Society of Friends. And while the Quakers in the 17th century had been um, persons engaged in the slave trade, by the late 18th century, they had embraced abolitionism. And they had encouraged all Quakers to divest themselves of their slave interests, and they were actively anti-slavery. And so the business of whaling, the the, the whole port of New Bedford and Fairhaven across the harbor uh, was focused on whaling as a business, and most of the, the whaling interest was held in the hands, uh, the biggest operators were Quakers. And so they were very eager to accept African Americans, not only because they were freeing, uh, fleeing from slavery, but also because uh, working on the, there was always a need for laborers on the whaling ships. It was dirty business. Most people only whaled for a single voyage. But if you're a, if you're a, a, a runaway African slave, 
and you have the opportunity to get on a whaling voyage, which is going to take you halfway around the world to the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean for two to three years, by the time you would come back, probably the person who owned you legally would, would have given up the chase. And you could have this opportunity to earn some money on par with the white guys you were working with on the boat or the Polynesians or the Portuguese islanders from Madeira or Azores. These were amazingly multilingual, multi-ethnic crews of the whaling vessels. And so African-Americans sort of fit right in and had a natural um, use for the kind of uh, circumstances that a whaling voyage and the advantages that a whaling voyage would give them. Uh, my colleague, uh, the independent historian Catherine Grover, has written a wonderful book about this called The Fugitives Gibraltar, Escaping Slaves and Abolitionism in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Came out about 20 years ago. There's our familiar uh, image from William Still's book on the cover. And she did all the research that showed, you know, just how many uh, of the uh, African-American population was, uh, was uh, escaped slaves. The other thing is that the abolitionists, the active abolitionism that's going on in New Bedford was not simply white uh, ship owners and their families. It was also very active amongst the African-Americans who lived in New Bedford. So New Bedford is hailed as a place where if you escape from enslavement, you can go there and you can be safe, you can make a living, you can earn property, you can buy a house. It gave lots of opportunity. Um, abolitionism and Quakerism around New Bedford has a very old history, even in the 18th century. One of the most important early guys is a guy called Paul Cuffey, who was, um, his father was from Ghana, and his mother was a Wampanoag Indian. He's born on Cuttyhunk Island across Buzzards Bay. But by the early 19th century, he's probably the wealthiest man of color in North America. Uh, he ran, he owned and operated ships. He is the owner of the very first ship that goes into Britain following the American Revolution, and it goes up the Thames River into London with an entirely African-American and Native American crew. And this made the London newspapers because it was so unusual. But the first U.S. flagged vessel to go into Britain is, is owned by this, this magnificent guy, Captain Paul Cuffey. Um, and so he's he's kind of a local hero around New Bedford. His son was a whaling captain, William Cuffey. This is, you can see the captain of a ship. But what's inter interesting about this whaling vessel, which is sailing in 1837, is that the entire crew is African-American or mixed race, one of the two. And so they're, they're operating vessels. Maybe you saw in the news not too long ago that a shipwreck was found in the... Um, uh, in the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico, which was from this family's uh, vessels. And it had been an all black crew where the ship went down in the Gulf of Mexico and with the loss of all hands. Um, Frederick Douglass, of course, escapes to New Bedford. It becomes his first home in freedom. And he lived in this house on the left, the white home, which was owned by two people of color who were abolitionists, Nathan and Polly Johnson. The home still stands. It's now a museum, and it's the headquarters of the New Bedford Historical Society that I mentioned earlier. Right next to it is a Quaker meeting house from the 18th century, and you can see it has two entrances, one for men, one for women. This was no longer used uh, when Frederick Douglass showed up in 1838, but a new one built in 1822 is just outside the photograph here. It's across the street on the other side. Um, and so the, the, the Quaker community in New Bedford was very large. Um, Frederick Douglass arrives in 1838. Um, this, he, to escape, he used the ruse of being a sailor. Uh, he had a, what was called a seaman's protection paper, which identified him as a free black man who was a sailor legitimately traveling by train uh, to get to a port where he would find work. Now, uh, Douglas dressed as a sailor, and he did, in fact, use several vessels to get up to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and then on to New Bedford. But he was never challenged. He wasn't asked to show his papers because Black sailors were so common, and he dressed the part, he looked the part, 
And so he managed to escape uh, without ever having to show the paper that he carried to prove that he was a free black man. This is a picture of the waterfront in New Bedford at about the time of the Civil War. There was always labor. And so these guys who had been trained in the South to be waterfront dockside workers who had been trained to be riggers and caulkers, uh, Frederick Douglass was a trained caulker, they could come to New Bedford and get work immediately using skills that they already had. So New Bedford provided this great opportunity for them. Uh, this is the harbor in the 1860s. It still looks a lot the same today, except it's different kinds of vessels. Uh, African-Americans contributed to New Bedford. Uh, one in particular, a blacksmith named Lewis Temple, who was from uh, North Carolina. Uh, he, um, he invents a harpoon that revolutionizes the whaling industry, a harpoon that uh, that that meant that he designed it so that it would stay stuck in the whale, and the um, uh, the percentage of successful hunts went up enormously as a result of this invention by an African American blacksmith whose whose harpoon revolutionizes whaling. Also, if we look at the artwork of 19th century whaling, African Americans are in all of the paintings, not, not all, but many of the paintings, uh, they are represented as members of the crew and they're very prominently represented. We have at least two people who are clearly folks of color uh, in this painting uh, from the 1830s uh, or 40s. Here's another one. Uh, of course, whaling is a very dangerous business and most people didn't go more than once or twice, but uh, it, was a, it was an opportunity for people of color. Um, I'm going to finish with just a note that we mounted an exhibition at the New Bedford Whaling Museum about uh, maritime dimensions of the Underground Railroad. It ran for six months in 2022, but now it's becoming a traveling exhibition. Its first uh, traveling show will be in Portsmouth, Virginia, opening next week. Uh, we also will have it in, uh, in Martha's Vineyard, and I'm looking for other places to have the show run uh, because uh, it has, you know, fantastic insight into how this all operated. Well, it's 8.30. I'm going to stop there. I've been speaking for about 40 minutes. And so uh, thank you all so very, very much for this opportunity to talk about the book. And I'll be very happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you.